Wow, they're saying it could be possibly coronavirus related. Um, I think we're not really, uh, we're live now, we're live now, <laughs> so. Um, okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from the Pan-African Daily TV. Yes, we can already see you uh, joining the stream right away. Um, just a couple of seconds um, as we go live. That's a very positive, positive sign. And I want to thank you all for joining this uh, stream uh, now for today. And uh, as you already saw that we are breaking, we are breaking today. Um, as all of us, uh, and the whole entire continent of Africa is mourning, is mourning the death of uh, Burundi's president, President Pierre Nkurunziza, mm -hmm. um, who passed away this day, the 8th of June, at the age of 55. At the age of 55, ladies and gentlemen, um, His Excellency Pien Kurunziza of Burundi is no more. We from the Pan African Daily TV extend our heartfelt condolence to the people of Burundi and particularly to his family. And um, yes, this is a dark day for Africa. And um, to last a president, a president at the age of 55. It's actually not um, a, a time, a time to die. It's not a time to die, ladies and gentlemen. And particularly uh, us from the Pan-African Daily TV, we're so concerned. We're so concerned, why? Because Burundi, Burundi um, is like a, a child, like a child of the International Africa Festival tubing in. Um, in 2016, uh, Burundi was the focus country of this massive event that we've been organizing out here. In 2016, Burundi was the focus country, yes. So we would be um, um, uh, talking about this break-in and uh, the current situation of Burundi, his past life, and also um, his private life. What was it that he actually um, what's fun at doing or known as doing. But today with me in the studio, um, and our topic for today, as we already announced is, um, Ghana is having a new voice. There is a new voice that is coming up so strong and powerful uh, from Ghana. And uh, like I already announced, the question is that we should be thinking about, uh, could the African diaspora be the game changer um, um, uh, to, to, to rescue, rescue the political leadership of Africa? Those are questions that we would be having as we, um, um, uh, as we are privileged, are privileged today to have our guest of honor today, uh, Mr. The Young, Smart, Energetic, I already said it, uh, Mr. Kofi Koranteng, Koranteng um, who is saying enough is enough. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to um, be mentored to, to be educated to, 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 to find out why. Why does Mr. Kofi thinks that the leadership of Ghana, which particularly at this time, a lot of people are looking forward to as one of the game changer in terms of its um, returning projects and some of the current projects that have been going on in Ghana. Um, the people of West uh, Africa are saying Ghana is an example, but Mr. Kofi is saying there's still a lot of unemployment for young people and there are some things that we need to fix it. And of course, why not? So ladies and gentlemen, in our studio we have our brother, we have the new face that could be the game changer on the continent of Africa, and particularly 
um, in the heart of West Africa, Ghana. Welcome, Mr. Kofi Korante. Hey, uh, Annie. Uh, it's a beautiful day to be here. I'm thankful that you would have me here. But of course, our hearts are heavy today uh, when we heard about the demise of uh, President uh, Ingrid Zazi. Uh, it, it's, it's a sad, sad day uh, that for the whole of uh, Burundi. Um, and uh, we, our hearts goes out to their families and the whole people, the beautiful people of Burundi uh, for this, uh, this really sad event. Um, and it, it just goes to just tell us all how life is short uh, mm -hmm. for us to continue to just uh, be serious about our perspective and uh, valuing life, every second of it. And that's why uh, we have to make the most of what we have, what we have been blessed with. Uh, and I'm thankful that you would invite me to your studios today. Um, to talk, reflect a little bit about our vision uh, for Ghana. And we believe that this vision uh, will be a fire starter for the whole Africa. Yes, of course. Um, we are seeing these changes and uh, especially the fact that, um, you know, it's been difficult to get the diaspora uh, getting involved and engaged in the political a landscape of the continent. I mean, it's always been like the diaspora should invest on the continent, the diaspora should join on the continent to build the economic capacity of uh, of the continent. But uh, but we've seen this kind of dyan dynamic that you say, yes, that's more to it than that, than just being an investor. We have to fix the leadership and so the investment would just follow. And I, and I share this point, I share it uh, absolutely because that is what we should be thinking about, not just repatriation, but how do we put the structures out there? How do we fix the policies? What kind of policies is the parliament currently making? What is the role of the young people in the, uh, in the current uh, uh, parliament of, of Ghana? And we know that the oldest, the oldest parliamentarian on the continent is sitting at the parliament of Ghana. I mean, these are things that we should also be looking into and um, yes, but we are happy to have you here. We're happy to have you here. And like you said, yes, we are aware of that fact. And today, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are mourning. Africa mourns the passing away of his son, a statesman, a leader of the people, um, uh, uh, Excellency Pierre Nkurunziza, um, who passed away at the age of 50. 55 at the age of 55. Yes, we'll be coming back to you, um, uh, Mr. Kofi, and um, we want to extend our condolences. I say it again, uh, our heartfelt mm -hmm. condolences um, for the passing away of a state man, of a state man that has saved three terms in office. I mean, uh, um, uh, His Excellency um, Kurunziza had been president from 2005 to 2020. That is 15 years and uh, rolling three times in office. And now we also know that before he, uh, he became president, he was chairman of the National Council for the Defense of Democracy, Forces for Defense of Democracy in Burundi, in Burundi. And he is the father of five children and leaving behind a wife, leaving behind a wife. It is so sad that we are coming on this edition today. But you see, um, it is in the same uh, um, voice that we're talking about today. A statement is going, and we're having another young brain um, um, replacing the continent. And so, yeah, I don't know. But a little overview, a little overview, um, uh, from uh, Burundi or about Burundi, we know Burundi um, is a small country. It's a small country comparable to the southern region of Germany. Comparable. I mean, they have a population of 11.7 million um, uh, people. The population of Burundi is 11.18. Okay, as of 2018, was 11.18 
uh, million. And Burundi got its independence from Belgium on the 1st of July, 1962. 1962, I mean, the, the, the Burundians speak diverse languages like Kurundi, French, and English. And the capital city we all know is Bunjubura, Bujumbura, Bujumbura. Now, what is so particular about this to us from the Pan-African Daily TV, like I said? Um, Burundi has been in partnership, in partnership. And I think, Mr. Kofi, it's very important for you to, to, to know and to listen to this because I think not Rhine Westphalia, not Rhine Westphalia uh, in Germany is in partnership with Ghana. It's in partnership with Ghana. And so uh, Burundi is in partnership with the southern region of mm -hmm. Germany called Baden-Württemberg. And they also have a population of 11.7 uh, million as of 2019. And this partnership has been existing since 30 years, 30 years. And you see the disproportionate to say, how can Germany has a partnership with Burundi for 30 years and Burundi is uh, one of the poorest continent, uh, continent, uh, countries on the continent as we know in Germany. And this southern province is one of the richest regions in, uh, in, in Germany. And those are the questions that we, the African diaspora, particularly our organizations that are raising questions and say, Burundi is even having a competent center, competent center located in Stuttgart. And uh, the southern region, but it has been doing corporations and projects together. And we really wanted to get into this corporation to find out what kind of development corporation that will be existing for 30 years, 30 years, and Burundi is still in abject poverty. So we didn't see that kind of a win-win situation from the part of Germans. And um, we started raising this question. Now, yeah, so, but it is as it is. And I think these are all questions that you, as the incoming or the president uh, um, aspirant for Ghana, should also, we would like to know about this kind of developmental partnership and corporations. How would you be responding to them? But that after your presentation. Now, um, coming back to you from the studio, from our studio here, um, um, we've been talking to Ghanaians uh, since I got to see uh, you coming up and uh, I've been asking a lot of questions to young Ghanaians. What do they think to get a, a candidate like you? And it was very interesting what they say. I had a short video that I wanted to play about what Ghanaians were saying about you, but unfortunately, our technique is not really supporting it. We've tried it again and it's just hanging. So I think we will do it some other time when we have you on the show. Um, back to you. What do you have on the plate for us? Well, uh, you know, let's go back to the question. I mean, your premise to this whole thing about Germany being in partnership with Burundi. Now we see yes. Burundi. Germany has uh, really exceeded uh, the... Um, uh, it's uh, 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 state. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Oh yes, uh, everybody sees you. They hear you. Oh okay. no. No. Okay. So uh, maybe there is something going on here. Um, just bear with me one second. I don't know why because I lost contact with you. Um, um, and we are hearing you. We are hearing you so much. But oh yes, oh yes. Now I see. Okay, so uh, what right. I was saying, is it is it good enough? It is good. Okay. It is good. Yeah. Can you hear me also? Yes, perfect. Okay. Excellent. So what I'm saying, uh, uh, Tata, Miss Tata, if you don't mind, I'll call you Annie. Uh, Annie, Annie. Annie. But, but what's 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 important to realize here is the fact that you know um, you cannot solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that the problem was conceived. And Correct. all over Africa, we have uh, old, worn out, mentally incapable, so-called people, they call themselves leaders, who are just milking the cow. You understand what I'm saying? Correct. Uh, and really, all you have to do is, I don't care what anybody else says, 
take a look at results. If you are results oriented, then your uh, variable for processing and for evaluating anything would be typically results. If you take a look at where Burundi is now, does that justify a partnership with Germany? Who really milked the cow? Well, it looks like the Germans got off easy on that one, right? They got everything they want from Burundi. Burundi didn't really get anything, and that's why we need to go and relook at the equation. Our, uh, our, our leaders competent enough to be sitting around that table negotiating? And the answer is no. And anybody who has doubt, just take a look at the results that they have brought home. Our leaders are supposed to be the hunters. They go out to hunt, get the kill, and bring it home for us to skin it. They haven't brought anything home. So it's time to let them go. We have to let them go because they haven't done anything for our countries, uh, respective countries in Africa. And particularly in Ghana, I could tell you that without any doubt, just step into Accra and take a look around and you know there's a serious problem regardless of what anybody says. And it's about time the mindset needs to change. We need to elevate ourselves into a whole paradigm of thinking. And that's why you said something very important about, uh, you know, we multi lean, we multi diverse in our thinking because of our exposure. Yes. Because when you come into, yeah, go ahead. I mean, we're going to really label this point because these are really the kind of things that um, we want to know about the policies that you're taking. Like I said, um, the diaspora, this competence, this competence in knowing both systems and knowing both, both systems could really be a game changer. We're still going to talk about this situation of Burundi because it's a it's it's an agenda that I know it is an agenda that we have been talking about this inequality in this partnership. And we have been questioning a lot, how do they actually function? I mean, you just taking a cash crop from Burundi like coffee and you are selling it uh, on a fair trade doesn't say that the situation of the women of Burundi is elevated. And now we know about um, the coup d'etat that took place in 2015 in Burundi that left um, more than 400,000 Burundians on Exodus. And most of them were actually located in Germany and without access, without access. And now you begin to ask yourself, what kind of partnerships are existing and existing and what kind of contracts um, this leaders mm -hmm. sign, do they even really actually know what they sign? It, 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 listen, it, these partnerships are non-existent. It has absolutely no value. The only people it has value to uh, are always the people in the West. And that's why we need to question the people we are putting in front of these contracts. Okay? And it's as simple as that. We don't even need to waste any time, any. We need to look at the conversation at the table should be how we get these people out. You know, you don't need to stress yourself thinking about how come they have ended up being the most ridiculous representatives of Africa. That's not why we're here. We, we, they have already proved themselves worthy of being useless for Africa. Do you understand me? So Correct. That, this, is not, this is not a conversation we need to have. The conversation is who are the young, vibrant, bold innovative, imaginative, artistic geniuses we could put to the table to start taking Africa to the next level. That's how, what we need to be talking about. These guys have had their turn, they failed us. And if you have any doubt, look at the report card. The report card has zeros, you understand me? Next. Right. So the conversation is, we need to go through our stockpile and look for the people who are ready. And this time we need to find out exactly, put people through a distilling process, a process that we can know before they even begin that they are ready for the big leagues. The people we have had take over positions who have represented Africa have not had the 
mental capacity. They do not even understand systems. They don't, uh, they don't understand the game. If I put you in front of a chess board to play chess with me and you did not understand the rules, I don't care how determined you are, any, you're not going to yeah. be able to be functional. Correct. Our leaders are not functional. They're not competent. They're not functional. They don't care about Africa. And that's why they have all performed this poorly. It's about time. We had it with them. Get them out of here. Let's bring in some new people and let's start this thing with some fresh minds who are bold, who know where Africa wants to go. We are tired of our children and our brothers dying on the Sahara. Correct. Going after green pastures that are totally non-existent. Mm -hmm. the, the, the greenest of pastures is right here in Africa. Mm -hmm. But because of poor, well, forget poor, no leadership, we don't even know we have the green pastures. We don't have a leadership. It's not good enough to say poor because with poor, you actually get something which is not good enough. We're not getting anything. So it's non-existent. Are you tired or you, you want to just have conversations here? I'm not, I didn't come here to have conversations with you, Annie. I came here to tell the whole world of Africa, it's time to wipe away these guys. Let them go home and sleep. Let us take over. Let's take Africa to a new high. We, there's no way we're going to be able to be globally competitive with this kind of performance. How are you going to be able to compete with uh, Usain Bolt in a wheelchair? How are you going to do that? We have African leaders in wheelchairs competing with Usain Bolt. Really? What's going on? <laughs> and, and, and you have me here. I mean, I'm, do I need to make my point? I don't think so. The point has already been made. Correct. Yes, but we want to know. We want to know. We want to know because, I mean, even these leaders, when they came on leadership, we had all this. I mean, before people we vote for them, it's the same kind of discussions. We are going to create jobs. We are going to. But sometimes you have the impression like, how come when they sit in that position, what happens? What happens? I mean, like, what is it that you want to do different when you get there? Uh, listen, the first thing, Africa's problems stems from one thing and one thing only. Leadership. When you solve leadership, everything else will fall in place. We have been the worst people picking leaders because we have fallen to something I call a grand deception. Mm -hmm. So this deception is what these political parties and these so-called uh, rulers come in and they're like magicians. They say, you know, Annie, look at me, look at me. Uh, this is, I have five here, and then they disappear, and you got two. Well, you got nothing, really. And this is what's been going on. Mm -hmm. We need to bring in, we need our people to understand that leadership is stewardship. Our people don't even understand stewardship, the people who claim they're our leaders. And then they think by having, uh, an intellectual extravagance when you have degrees, you went to school at this university, you went to Oxford, you went to Yale, you went, then you are qualified to lead. That's not true because when you have education, you also have to be functional. You have to know how to apply that which you have acquired so that it's relevant. What they acquire in terms of so-called the intellectual knowledge, it's not functional. We have all the sun in the world, yet we don't have power. Really? What happened to solar energy? Well, nobody really talks about that, really. How can we be a continent of darkness? How can we be a continent when the most common thing we have for free is the sun? Really? Because our people are not functional. And then because we worship status, we when somebody comes in and is like, oh, they doctor this, they then we give them a chance to come and rape us again. And then they come and rape us. 
They rape your father, they rape your daughter, they rape your mother, they rape your grandmother, they rape the dogs in the house. Do you understand me? And then they sure. left us with nothing. So now what we're saying is this, we are gonna have people who have a multi-faceted thinking capacity, understanding functionality and systems to come in. See, listen, we talk too much about this. This thing is a simple process if you know how, Any, If you don't know it, you think it's complicated. Mm -hmm. There is no, it's, listen, Any, even if you did not know this, that which you're looking for has been bought and done by some country. So the least we could be is the best country in the world because we could just pull pages out of their book and copy it, right or right? Tell me, we can't even do that. We can't even copy for crying out loud. Copy, we all did that in school, right? You sit next to somebody, look at over your shoulder, copy something you don't understand. Our leaders can't even do that. Correct. So what good are they? They can't even copy. You don't even have to know any, you just have to have the good heart to recognize what's good. You can't even recognize what's good? That's totally inexcusable. Do you understand me? I All hear you. we have to do is, but listen, we live in a world today, Annie, where you don't have to know anything. I could go on the internet today and pretty much get everything that I, on the internet. So if you don't know something, well, if we want to build it and make it functional like Dubai and Singapore and uh, uh, Japan and Sweden and, and get pieces of all these economies put together and make it into every country in, in Africa, all we need to do is to get a page out of their book. We can't even do that. And then we allow them to travel around the world on, at our expense. And they come back and they still have nothing. And they have they party at the biggest hotels and have fun and they you know uh, it, it's over the party is over in Africa this is time for serious work 2020 and beyond no nonsense correct if you cannot perform go home and stay home and we're gonna make sure you stay home so you don't interrupt the process of elevation we want to take off in Africa now. You see what's happening? You saw what happened with George Floyd? The whole world is telling us, if you're black, we don't value your life because we haven't been able to do anything for ourselves. Do you understand me? We haven't been able to do anything for ourselves. This is a time for the whole of Africa. You saw what happened with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. When coronavirus came, all our leaders all scratching and clawing looking for WHO to bring us a vaccine. What happened to us? What happened to our medical specialists, our doctors? Uh, what happened to them? How come we cannot assemble the best of the best to come out with the, the therapeutics, uh, 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 the vax, whatever? Why do we always have to rely? Oh, president signing uh, the, some type of uh, agreement, acknowledgement saying that, oh, if you develop a vaccine, we're going to buy from you. Really? Uh, what kind of thinking is that? We always have to stoop to the West for our survival? Come on. And you call yourself a leader? You're not a leader. You're not a leader. We're tired of that. Our children are dying. Our mothers are suffering. Um, our, our fathers are retired, don't have pension plans, we don't have water to, any. Yes. How can we not have water to drink? Our children are graduating from the best schools with the best teachers who are paid almost nothing, and when they graduate, the best place they find themselves is to go to American embassy or the English uh, embassy to get a visa to go abroad. What kind of mindset is that? Everybody thinks the best places to be is somewhere they haven't been before, and then we are left with what? We need to change that mindset. The only way we can bring back 
some type of assurance and sanity to our people is by fixing what we have, what we've been blessed with. And you need a specific mind to be able to do that. These guys, their time is up. Their time is up. We need to retire all of them. The whole of Africa, the whole of Africa, we changing everything. Correct. And it starts in Ghana. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it sounds, um, it sounds inspiring. It sounds uh, forward thinking. And I mean, that's as a matter of fact, that's what we are doing. That's what we should be doing. But let us stick on the realistic, on the realistic. That's I mean, the problem. You're, living, you're everybody, living. Everybody thinks realistic. Yeah. Um, realistic <laughs> is the state of the mind. Okay. <laughs> Just like with everything else. Okay. We are here to listen. When you say realistic, it means you use them a prism of the mind that you are already used to, to evaluate, to process. What we are going to be using now, the youth of today are going to be using a different mindset. The paradigm we are using has not been experienced in Africa before. So there is no Correct. realistic with what we are doing because you have nothing to compare it with. Yeah. But, but but I want I want I want us to come back to this. Probably maybe the paradigm of the choice of what was not really just coherent or fitting in that part. But I want to ask something. You are in the diaspora, mm -hmm. and you want to change a country, uh, uh, Africa. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I'm just bringing us to the point for us to understand um, a pretty much better. I mean, because the reality. The reality in Ghana is it isn't it different? Like, look at the, the laws, the parliament. I already made mention, and we're still gonna have him here. That all the saving parliamentarian on the continent is sitting in the parliament in Ghana. They make the laws. They have the judiciary. They have they have the executive. Your point is. My point is, if he's the oldest. And we've seen all the presidents come and go. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to shift the laws? Because it is good to have a policy. We all have the policies. And everything we see in the West is because probably the systems are different. But, the law is active. How are you going to realize that in Ghana? Ghana has no problem with laws. Now, I'm not saying okay. the Constitution is the best. I'm saying that the Constitution needs changing. It needs overhauling. And that's one of my pet peeves we're gonna constitution is gonna be overhauled okay, okay. but yeah. the problem is not just the law when laws are crafted you need a system to make sure that the laws are enforced okay you need a system where it tells you where you apply the law and it goes through a system where people who go uh, 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 against the law are prosecuted when you have a law that is only um, uh, uh, favors some people and, 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 and works against some people, then that's not democratic enough. That's Correct. not law. Do you see what I'm saying? So the problem is not that Ghana needs laws. The problem is you need a system to enforce it mm -hmm. and make sure it plays its course. Correct. That's the huge difference. And if you don't have, if you have a leadership that's corrupt, they don't, the, the laws will work against you, Annie, if they don't like you. But for the, in, I call them the incompetent twins, they dance with the law because nobody gets arrested. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes to jail for all the wrongdoing. Everybody points a finger. I point a finger to you and uh, you point a finger at me, but then when I get in power, I cannot prosecute you. When you get in power, you cannot prosecute me, and we dance around, hey, hey, hey. That's kind of the nonsense we've been dealing with for the last 28 years in the Fourth Republic in Ghana, okay? The way mm -hmm. the NPP, which is the ruling government now, got into power is because uh, they, they talked uh, uh, about the NDC, which is the opposition government, that they were criminals, and they were going to arrest them for wrongdoing and corruption. And they came in, and we haven't seen a rat's tail go to jail. Not mm -hmm. even a rat go to jail. Why is that? 
because you got to understand the way the compact system works in Ghana, it's almost impossible for one lawmaker or one politician to put the other politician uh, into 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 uh, 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 the arms of the law. It doesn't happen. So you can't do anything. So they just playing musical chairs with the Ghanaian people. And they come, they get paid, they enjoy life, and they go away, and Ghana continues to sink. Just today, just today, rainfall. For so many years, we've had floods in Ghana. Just today, mm -hmm. I had, uh, it rained. When it rains, where countries beg and pray and do all sorts of things for rain, we get it in abundance. When we get it, it kills people. It, it, is, is that not sickness? When we could be using it to cultivate the land for crops, when we get the rains, it actually destabilizes people from their homes and it kills people. Now, what kind of sick government is that? What kind of sick government that has had this happen every year, at least for the last five years? Every time it rains, we get flooding, people are uh, dispositioned from their homes, people die every year. And they come in and they say, you know what, we're going to give the contract to somebody. It never gets done. A year, another year comes again. The same thing happens. It comes again. And people keep dying. Three years ago, 150 people plus died because of the, the rains, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. has been done. Who does that? Who does that? Who in their right mind will vote for these types of people? You got to be something wrong with your head to be voting for these guys. I'm serious. But we worship, we worship status so much when somebody comes to you and says, oh, I'm with the ruling party, NPP. Oh, I'm with the NDC. People feel obligated that they have to get them. No, that's sickening. That's sick. And we need to change the paradigm. See, the power is not in their hands, no matter how much money they have. The power is in your thumb. When you decide that these people, you have had enough with this nonsense, all you got to do is just vote them out. Vote them out. And that's what we are requesting of every Ghanaian. The 2020, get these guys out of here. We had enough of them. Get them out of here. <laughs> get them out of here. Okay. We, don't have, we don't have the time and the patience for nonsense. People are dying any people are dying go to hospitals you will see women on floors they have babies how come the same minister who drives a hundred thousand dollar car which is not his that the government buys for him allows for a medical facility to be so run down women have to have children on floors i don't get it do you get it any no do one no come on and then you want to vote back these guys in power you have got to be sick in the mind seriously you have to be sick in the mind to vote back these guys into power they don't have a place we have to put them we have to park them in a garage lock them up throw the keys somewhere else and let them stay there we bring them food and feed them in a the garage because they're not fit to do anything and this goes for the whole of africa Listen, the youth, we have gone to a point where the youth, this is a call to the youth, the whole Africa, this is a time for us to elevate. We have to lift ourselves up. We're not taking any nonsense anymore. We have had it with the stupidness, with all these uh, criminals. They, these are cartels, criminal organizations, okay? I do not understand why Africa is poor. Do you? Any, no. Do you understand? Because no, if you did, and that would be the end of this conversation. I'll begin off this right now. I do not understand. Correct. And we should not take that nonsense any longer. That's the point. We've had enough. Okay. Um, now let's come direct to I saw in, in one of your one of your, your posters, and that, that was what first of all caught my attention because I like, yes, this is absolutely what we need. But We've been seeing all the, uh, we've also been experiencing and seeing all these posters where you say, um, in your first three years of office, you're going to make 10,000 Ghanaians millionaires. How do you intend to do that? That's so I'm easy. 
that's not that's not one of our problems. That's so easy. It's not even worth the time to talk about. It's so easy. It's so easy. Okay. So do you have a calculator? Let me show you. Okay. I have my I'm not, I'm not very good in mathematics, okay. but I will pay attention. Let me give you just one on one crop in Ghana, and it happens all over in in the whole of Africa. Mm -hmm. So, in cocoa, right? In mm -hmm. cocoa, the hedge fund that buys cocoa from Ghana, it's not even made up of Ghanaians. I think there's only one Ghanaian in that fund. What okay. they do is they bring banks together, raise money, and they sort the cocoa from Ghana. And they give the Ghana government maybe three, two to three billion dollars every year. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then they buy the cocoa, they, and they bring it to the world market, and they set the prices and all that good stuff. Now, does that make any sense to you where we grow cocoa, we don't set the price. Somebody else sets the price for us because our government has allowed them because they love for money to be given to the government here in America. They get a check, two, three billion dollars, and they do whatever they want to do with it before they, the money even gets to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So now the people who arrange for that funding are not Ghanaians. They are anything but Ghanaians. If you were to do cooperatives where you put people together to raise the money from the diaspora, you listening to me? And you <laughs> raise, listen, first of all, Ghanaians bring home over $6 billion every year. $6 billion in remittances, that alone. Now, we know, according to the Clinton Global Initiatives, that every dollar sent to Ghana, there is an equatable $3 in a liquid account in the in the domicile of that origination so if i live in the u.s i have a checking account if i send hundred dollars to ghana every year i have three hundred dollars in my checking account or savings account we know that right mm -hmm. okay so if there is a three billion dollar fund that buys coco you could use if you put together cooperatives now, a bit, a bit, first of all, a, a millionaire is just somebody who makes $200,000 a year because you got to understand a million at the Ghana city is uh, five times that of a dollar. So one dollar is equal to five cities times five, right? Mm -hmm. You get it? Mm -hmm. So okay. just one, so one billion dollars, one billion dollars represents you. If, how many thousands are in? How many millions are in a billion? Okay, so a thousand, a thousand. So if a thousand makes a billion, right? And there mm -hmm. is five of those in every billion. Then it means for every billion we can make five thousand millionaires simple math simple five thousand millionaires all you have to do is to put them in a cooperative where the money that they put in is the same money that you use to buy the cocoa it's not some foreigners who are making that money it's their own people in god the Ghanaians who live abroad who live in ghana who are putting the money together for you to sort the uh uh, uh, fund the cocoa. It's as simple as that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I Is that, it, it, It's just that simple. All we you see, all we doing, uh, uh, any is you are repositioning w the point at which money comes into Ghana to buy things. That's all you are doing. Listen, in Ghana right now, even toilet tissue we import, toothpick we import. Okay. Do you know how much money? We are over $400 billion of sugar comes into Ghana every year. $400 million of sugar means you have four times five, which is 2,000 
people. You can make 2,000 millionaires just from sugar. It's a numbers thing. And this is not complicated. So all we're doing is we're putting Ghanaians together for them to pull the monies to be the people who are creating this wealth. It's not going to foreigners. Do you understand me? We don't make anything in Ghana. We don't manufacture anything. So for once, we're going to have a policy where everything is going to be manufactured in Ghana. But even if we took one product, you can create 10,000 millionaires from that. Just one product, cocoa. Mm -hmm. One product, cocoa. That's it. And I just did the numbers for you. I mean, that that is absolutely uh, uh, correct. And that's even why we're having this discussion, because that's the kind of mindset, um, like you said, or a shift in this organic, in this organic paradigm. Now, um, we know, we know that the policies are in place. We know that the mathematics are in place. We even convinced, really, just just this kind of thinking, and we see the reality because the Africa that we're building or the Ghana that we want to see mm -hmm. is a more productive Ghana, not a consuming Ghana. And we are absolutely with that point to say, this is the kind of leadership that we want. But sometimes uh, we have the impression that it takes really um, a damn while to break it down for those that are voting for this candidate to understand. Now, my question is like, for instance, I don't know about Ghana, that's why you're here to educate us. Now, we see that even though young people or the voters, they know particularly this is the situation, but because of this tribal, he comes from Ashanti, we, he, he doesn't you know, speak a tree or whatever, and they're just gonna vote the wrong person in place. How do you wanna ensure that this good concrete policies that you that you that you're breaking to us here, which we support and gonna stand behind you to make sure that we push you into the system. How would you break it down for young people to understand, to understand right up to the rural sectors? How's the okay, communication? So that's not an issue. And let me tell you why it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Any, if you went into a hospital right now with your daughter, let's say you have a little daughter, she was very sick and she needed a surgical procedure and you come into a hospital would it matter what tribe i would be if i were the surgeon who could take care of your daughter would it matter for me not exactly. but well let me tell you if, if, if you were a human being and if you love your daughter and you worry about you were concerned with a surgeon who will uh would have to be from a certain tribe to be able to save your daughter then you you an idiot. Do you understand me? So, so it's as simple as that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So what I'm saying is, is people don't care about the good that's coming to them, the, who is coming from. People don't care about who they're getting good from, something good from. If it's good and it can be justified, you can prove that you get doing something for them, for them to benefit. That's all people care about. What we're going to be concerned with is we're going to be communicating to people to let them know how much uh, uh, of the, the system has taken advantage of them. We're going to put hospitals. We're going to put schools. We're going to make the farming work again. We're going to create arteries of uh, 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 roads into the deepest of the forest so the farmers will get their foods to storage facilities. Uh, for us to store. Farmers would not even have to worry about them selling on the open market. You, mm -hmm. you, you have your crops, you bring it to a center, a government approved facility, they check your crops, then they pay you money and you go. You with me? We're going to train people to have model farms, uh, to have seed nurseries, to train people to get, and we're going to make sure we helping people in all the rural areas so we can de- populate the cities and have people have access cards where it would have money on it based on what they're giving to the government in terms of produce where it can only be used in their respective regions you can't bring it into the city to use it the cards can only be used in your respective towns and villages so that it will cause people to go back into the villages and bring it life back to these places again but we're not just going to do that you're going to make sure people 
all the facilities that, and the amenities that cause people to move from all the rural areas to the city, you're going to give to all the regions and all the towns and all the small little villages. So they have the hospitals, they have schools, they have uh, 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 police departments that protects them and protects the assets. Um, uh, this is what people want. People want amenities to be able to live life the way they, the way they want to live life. If you give these things to them at the point where they are born, they will not come migrate into the city. But that's not what's happening in Ghana. Everything is concentrated in Accra and maybe Kumasi. That's why all the young people are coming into Accra because they think by coming into Accra, they have access to the basic necessities. But it doesn't have to be like that. Absolutely. These are, these are all control schemes by the politicians. These are Absolutely. all control schemes. Yes. You don't have to do that. You see, any when you build to rise a tide, a rising tide floats all boats. When it's a rising tide for the whole nation, all the boats, regardless of where you are, mm -hmm. rises. That's how you have to think. And this is the different paradigm that we're bringing. You're not just going to put facilities in Accra or Kumasi. You're going to put it everywhere so people will have access. When people in the rural areas feel that they've been deprived, that's when they start thinking, you know what? This guy is gone. This guy is everywhere. This guy is this and he did this in his country. He did this in his town or village and he didn't do it in mine. But if he has it just as much as you have it, you think anybody's going to look over their shoulder and worry about you have more than that's listen, you go to Nigeria, it's the same thing. You know, different parts of Nigeria has different access to different things. And that's why people who are in the more deprived areas feel uh, that they, they've been shortchanged. And that's why tribal wars start. But if everybody has everything, why would there be tribal wars? We For marry each, each other. The, uh, we cross breeding in terms of tribes. We uh, so why would anybody? It's it's this is something that has been created by the politicians. Oh, you hate me. I don't like you because uh, nonsense. Give them access. Give them amenities. Let g give them resource. They will be happy and they will value their lives and they will not have to worry about anybody else's life. They will be able to live their lives the way they want to live their lives. And that's what right. this is about. Yes. Um, now, I'm going to get to, to, to one direct question. Now, you're going to be president. You're going to be the voice of, Af uh, uh, of Ghana, of Africa, of Africa. And when I say Africa, because if Ghana set the pace, I mean, every other wing would follow. You're an inspiration to, to, to the voices, not only the voices, but to this kind of brave heart that we are saying, the diaspora are the game changer on the question. But, but the question comes back. Now, you are president of Ghana. Who would be your partner? We, we know that we would have to be dealing with developmental partnership and corporations. I mean, do you see China like one of your partners? Anybody could be a partner. It, it, listen, it, it's not about who being your partner, it's who you can leverage from. You, right. you got to understand, listen, it's okay for anybody to be your partner, the only thing is you don't bend over for them to ride on your back. That's what we're saying. When you have uh, the leaders who can negotiate, who don't love their countries, and they're bending over for all these countries to ride over their backs, that's totally unacceptable. Correct. Do you understand me? That's totally unacceptable, and that's what we cannot stand. And this is the new Africa. We're not having that. We can negotiate. Listen, we have lived with them. The best people to negotiate with these people from the West is the people who have lived with them. We have gone to school with them. We have lived with them. We know what they eat, how they eat, what they like, what they don't like. We know how they think. We are the best people to sit across the kitchen table and negotiate with them. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And this is what blows my mind. They pick somebody from Africa, Ghana somewhere, and they bring him and all of a sudden they are the ambassador for the US and they have not even, they don't even understand how the thinking works. It's Correct. a science, any, it's a science. If you don't get the science, you will never really understand how this thing works. This is not something you just sit down and come up with just because you think you have a degree. No, it's a culture. You have to acclimate into this culture to understand Correct. how these people think. You, you understand me? It's not, yeah. it's not just black and white like that. 
And these guys think, oh, just because they have some degrees under their belt, they can get up and everybody minister of this, minister of that. And they're running the country dry because they are not functional. They are not competent. You see, this is the first time, any that you're going to have a president of Ghana who is going to be run the whole country based on science. Science-based, data-driven, human-centered leadership. That's what we're talking about. That's a paradigm. They don't get it. They don't get it. You have a Kufuado comes and says, I'm going to make Accra the cleanest city. Go to Accra now and see if it's the cleanest city. It's not. Well, now the question is, how on earth could he have said that? What kind of data was he using when he made that statement? His advisors who told him to say that should be fired because he didn't have any data. Because if he had data, he would know exactly where he was starting and where he was ending. Because right. he doesn't have eight data, the place is still filthy. That's why Trump calls us a shithole. Mm -hmm. And it is a shithole. Go to a cry and you will find out. We cannot run the continent just based on how we feel. You sleep, you wake up. Oh, today is a nice day. Ah, let's go make a big hole in the middle of the jungle somewhere. Yo, it has to be based on data. This is not, listen, this is not guesswork. This is an art, science. These guys, they don't have a clue. Mentally incapable. You get it? Correct, correct. Good. I'm glad you get it. What's the next question? Of course, of course. I mean, I mean, we are all saying it. It's very obvious that we get it. And and, and that's why for us, um, and to have you on the Pan-African Daily TV is the start point, is the start point why the diaspora must, must rescue the leadership of Africa. I mean, one of these points that we were talking about is exactly this point of um, knowing both systems, knowing the business culture and understanding the business culture of every system. And that's why uh, we started the conversation with this Burundi, Germany, I mean, Burundi and Southern Germany relationship. And we took just one example one example of two countries, I mean, Burundi is a whole country, but we're talking about just a region that has the same population like Burundi. And you saw that this, this negotiations, something must have been wrong about it. And now you're talking about this kind of systems. I mean, we know Germany is database, database scientific system and also socially oriented that they begin to say, yeah, when we're dealing with a business with a country in Africa, let's think about the people first. But in this case, it absolutely was think about us first, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the point that, at what point do you say, you could have been just like any other diaspora who would say, uh, uh, I'm having a better life in the diaspora. I've made my way out here and qualified. I would just go home, build my, I don't know, a home for me when I retired and I enjoy the sea, the breeze, the nature, the home feeling. What actually, Annie, at what point did you say no? A, Annie, we have to be a commander in chief. At what point? Any, I am Ghanaian, 100%. I will always be Ghanaian. I mm. love my people. I love my country. I love my continent. And it comes to tears. I come to tears every day when I see the havoc in Ghana and in Africa. Correct. When I see the abuse, when I see the suffering, it blows me away. And I cannot live this life any longer living in somebody else's country, bringing value to their land where my people suffer. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's too painful to do this. And after seeing George Floyd with what he went through with a police officer for many, many seconds, kneel on their neck, 
that should cause every African to think. Because, you know, if we built our continent and we had the respect and we were able to provide for ourselves, we will not be treated like that around the world. See, mm -hmm. everywhere I go and I travel, even when I see people smile and offer service to me, I know deep down inside they really don't respect me anyway. And who am I to demand respect? Because if you know it so well, Annie, why don't you go to your continent, go to your country and fix it? Correct. <laughs> so I am at a point where I am embarrassed. I can't travel any longer. The plane that you sit in, you did not make. The places that you, the, 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 the clothes on our backs, uh, Annie, look at you right now. Tell me anything about you today that you have on your body that was made in your country. Don't tell us because we will all start crying. Not many, if you would get one. You with me? And it's like that everywhere in Africa. We just buy, buy, buy. We do not develop anything. We do not manufacture anything. All we do is we consume. Mm -hmm. Only animals consume. You know, when you were born into life, you did not have a say when your parents were making a decision to bring you into this life. But the moment you got here in life, you saw everything you were exposed to and you made a decision and you came to the realization that you had to develop yourself to be somebody else. And you have developed yourself to be who you are today. We have come to a point as Africans that we want to develop ourselves and get ourselves out of dependency entitlement mindset into an empowerment control for ourselves mindset. We want to do for ourselves. We want to manufacture for ourselves. We want to create for ourselves. We want to create innovative, imaginative, artistic, scientific minded people who think on a multifaceted, uh, complex, uh, 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 you know, vertical, uh, integrated thinking systems to bring everything that we need to Africa. Because you know what, any the black man outside of Africa is perfect because they use us for pretty much everything. How come we cannot do for ourselves? Doesn't it bother you? Everywhere in the world, you would see a black man doing something. But only when you come to that black man's land, totally non-existent. Correct. Does that make sense to you? It should get to a point where any thinking human being should start getting concerned. And we are, in case you didn't know, we are a race on an ex extinction path. That's why everybody's talking about depopulating us because if you occupy space and you don't bring anything to the value, you're not relevant. And that's why there are all these schemes to depopulate Africa. And our own leaders are part of the schemes. Some know, some don't, but they're so ignorant, we don't have the time for them to think to come to know. We have to put them to the side and take over the ship or they're going to drown us. See, the biggest corona we have in Africa are so-called leaders. We have to be the new vaccines. We have to vaporize that old thinking, old people, the, the, the thought process that don't do anything for Africa. We have to park that under some boxes and put it away for good. This is a new Africa. You can't stop us now. We are here. We're here to stay. Let's make okay. it happen. Yeah. 
it's good it's fine and um now we have been talking and belaboring your policies your vision of uh, a new ghana now ghana is existing as a country on a continent and um one thing that i admire about you when i read about you and i talked with you in the background is this 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 focus about ghana for you is a small step but you want to see this kind of leadership all over africa it means when ghana breaks africa break and now you're going to be working with neighbors with partners we have the african union that is there and you would have to make decisions that would also affect the entire continent and we're saying um god uh, africa should unite it means the same things that you wish for um at ghana is the things that you wish for the entire continent because we can't see ghana existing in in this overflows in uh, under your leadership and then the neighbors are still having this kind of leadership that would in any other way impact impact ghana we're talking about borders we're talking about africans advocating for a for a single status for the entire continent I mean, we're not saying that we're going to realize that, but the spirit of Pan-Africanism is saying we want to be united. We want to we want to stand as a strong continent, as an ally to the world in capacity, in security, and, and, and. But now, how would you, as a president of a very strategic country on the continent, ensure that I mean, you want you alone in Ghana, a good president, and we have the 55 that are not good. How are you going to do that? Well, what are you asking for a, a united Africa, one currency, one passport, when language, the system of education has to be refurbished, and, and, and? Well, listen, the biggest thing, the biggest revolution we're bringing to Africa is a revolution of the mind. You with me? When the rest Correct. of Africa sees that Ghana has changed and its people are starting to enjoy things they never enjoyed in the past, guess what happens? It starts a revolution in Africa. The people, see, when the people are ready, the leader will appear. The reason why the leaders have not appeared is because the people have not been ready. But now mm -hmm. the tide is changing. So what we are doing is listen it, it you only need one matchstick to set a light a whole forest um you don't Kofi, need much. yeah Kofi, um I, I hear people indicating that the volume is low um i don't know whether it's from our part you're saying the, vo the volume is low emmanuel the volume is lower just just let me see if you need to the increase volume is low. the volume because i get you pretty well and I think it's, can you just increase the volume a little bit? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Is it better? Is it better? I think, yeah. Is it better? Let me. Yeah. Is it better? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. So, so what I'm saying, Eddie, is we're going to set, when we set the standard in Ghana, and Ghana is beautiful, Ghana is like, Dubai and Singapore and Japan and Sweden and other our brothers and sisters from all the African nations come into Ghana and they see that man Ghana has been able to do it guess what happens now they start looking at their leaders more critically and they start saying wait a minute how did this happen now and guess what they start demanding and that's when this whole pack of cards comes crushing Mm -hmm. You only need one domino to be flipped, and then the whole cascade comes down. It's as simple as that. You, you are one positive leader. You're very one positive leader on the continent, and now you're sitting with 56, now 56 plus the 56 nation, on the table, and you want to nego uh, negotiate uh, a security seat. In, in in the in the in, in the security council of the united nation and you are one of them that thinks differently out of the 56 on the table of the african union it's it's so easy see you're not just one 
You one that everybody aspires to. You one that has made it work. You one that have shown the light to the rest of the world. You one that everybody's coming into your nation. You know when foreign uh, uh, the, when um, uh, foreign direct investments and foreign institutional investments starts coming into your nation. All the African mm -hmm. nations are going to wonder, wait, how come he's doing that? And then they're going to realize that the answer has been for us to revamp our infrastructure. So if you want to know why, how, we, how we did that, will we just have to open our doors to let you know that, listen, these are the things that you need to change. So we're going to be a strong economy and not be too dependent on the rest of the African nations. Even if we are going to be, it's going to be lopsided. So mm -hmm. if I am strong and you mm -hmm. want something that I have, I don't think that's going to be a very difficult negotiation for if if you want something that I have, you better listen to what I did. I'm, I don't have to come and convince you. I've created an economy. Listen, when the last time um, uh, the President Trump came to Ghana to sit with a Kufuado to talk about how he needs to change things, he doesn't care about him. He doesn't even know the guy exists. You know why? Because America is self-sufficient. He only talks to people he needs something from. So when the, the, the answer to that question is, make it work for your country. And then when it works for your country that everybody wants to get something out of there, then you use that as a negotiating block to negotiate. It's as simple as that. And who wants from, I don't need to do business with all the 50, other 54 nations of Africa. If I have all the production lines in the country and we exporting surpluses and our foreign exchange reserves are up. I don't care if you don't come do business with me. I think it's about time you came to learn something from what we're doing. That's not going to be something I'm going to be begging you for. Wake up. And you are not, you, I'm not going to be speaking to presidents about changing. I'm going to be speaking to the youth about lifting up and forcing change, making crafting change thrusting you thrust a change whether you like it or not when the change comes it blows you apart that's right. what we're going to be doing so whether you like it or not when change comes to the door trust me you will be changing if you don't change we will change you okay i mean this sounds interesting this sounds mind-blowing it's, it's, it's not supposed to be interesting this is it's come listen yes Penny, listen to me the bullet has left the nozzle. <laughs> it's coming. You just have to brace for impact because it will hit you at some point. So if you're an African leader and you, your consciousness is, oh, well, I don't care about this guy talking all this stuff. Well, guess what? The bullet was already shot. The bullet, the gun was already shot. The bullet is coming. At some point, it will hit you. And it will hit you soon. My job is to accelerate the process and compress time frames so I shorten the distance as quickly as possible so you get the impact before you wake up tomorrow morning. That's what my job is. And you will get hit. I promise you, it's coming. Brace for impact. I mean, this 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 is actually the point where we said I'm already I'm already carried by the bullet. Now I don't know about you outside watching, and so the lines are open. The lines are open for your impression, for your contribution, and for your direct questions mm -hmm. uh, to to our guest um, that has been actually con confirming and and assertively saying all the visions that we have been. Um, uh, talking about for the Africa we want and for the kind of leadership we want. And now as the lines are open, I want to bring a very important announcement to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on the 27th of June, on the 27th of June, the PLO Lumumba Foundation would be having a mentorship conference. Mm -hmm. Now you save the date um, because we're going to be streaming mm -hmm. this conference live from the Pan-African Daily TV. On the 27th of June, the PLO mentorship conference under the team redefining pan-africanism the role of the young people now we're gonna go on taking the calls and they start flooding in um hello 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 yes hello 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 any 
Yes. Yes, this is Patrick. Okay, Patrick. Good evening. How are you? Calling from uh, Kampala. Yes, from Kampala. I'm very blessed, and uh, mm -hmm. yes, I must. I must say, I'm very happy listening to the current speaker, mm -hmm. Mr. Kofi. About uh, transforming the country of Ghana. Yes. I, I definitely agree with him that uh, the problem of Africa is entirely uh, on the leadership that has failed to put in systems that work. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I read a book written by Lee Kuan Yew about his leadership and how he transformed the country, a simple mm -hmm. small island of Singapore into an industrialized country, it amazed me because when Lee Kuan Yew came to power, the economy of my country, Uganda, at the time, I think was about four times better than that of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And in what we have in Uganda, in terms of the natural resource endowment, you can't compare. Uganda is far much richer, just like most of the African countries, the sub-Saharan African countries. We have so much but our leaders have failed us. Why? When you look at what Singapore did, Lee Kuan Yew first of all put in a system that kicked out corruption. And then he went ahead to put in a proper educational system. He kicked out whatever the British had left in Singapore. Meaning that Singapore started producing a workforce that was having an innovative mind. A workforce that was patriotic. When we started building the army for Singapore, he did not build a personal army. He built a national army. And that is what is failing us in Africa. Correct. When he went on to the negotiation to negotiate for the loans that our African leaders always go for, he went and negotiated good terms that at his country. Okay. So, yes. So do you have a question direct uh, to him? There are just too many calls coming in. Please keep it short so that we can pick the calls of others. Yes. Go ahead. So now, this is what I can tell my brother. He has the right thing. He has the right mindset. Mm -hmm. This is the advice that I can give him. To avoid... No, I'm just having... A, I, I, want, I want to... Yes, I, I, I want to. I just want to give him advice on how to go ahead with these programs that he what he wants to do. Okay. Because one of the, the systems that the African leaders have done to, to to discourage development in Africa is keeping the youth under educated. Okay. Yes. And that's something that it's easy for them to be manipulated and be used to overthrow the people with the right mindset. So right now that he has that dream, he needs to make sure this kind of information that we are sharing on this platform is trickled down to the youth of Ghana, especially those that are not well exposed to information. So that in case they, somebody comes to try to manipulate them to cause a coup, they are well aware of this. Correct. But I want to assure him that he has the right dreams, he has the right program, and that is the man that Ghana needs at this very moment. Oh, and yes. This is the kind of people that the whole of Africa needs. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I mean, that's why we're having him here, and that's why we want him not only for Ghana, but a role model to the entire continent of Africa. Thank you so much for your contribution and your advice. Oh, my God. Yeah, thank you. Please, um, I know, I know, I know. Please keep your questions short and directed. Just so many calls coming in. We're not going to make it today if we start calling at randomly like this. Let's call, go straight to the question, and we answer. Thank you very much. All right. The next caller, hello. Yeah, so, good evening, my dear. Good evening. Yeah, my name is uh, Anzanzi. I'm a Ghanaian. I'm calling from the uh, UK. Okay, Anzanzi. Yeah. Thank, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kofi. 
Mr. Kofi, I've been uh, following him, uh, very eloquent, uh, very uh, intelligent uh, man. Uh, and I really wish uh, in the December elections he will become the president of Ghana by uh, the f January next year. But um, Susan, you asked uh, our brother a very good question. And uh, he didn't really get the answer. I don't know if he gave you the answer concerning about Africa, the tribal politics playing a greater role in between them choosing our leaders. There's no, there's absolutely no doubt that in Ghana, leaders are chosen based on tribal, tribal, tribal politics. They are not chosen based on their competence. If it was going to be by competence, we wouldn't have the, the some of the, we wouldn't have been where we are today. So the reality is that our people choose leaders based on tribal politics. So Mr. Kofi can can be brilliant. He can he can have all the ideas. But what I want to know is how is he going to get the power to be able to implement all these ideas? Because I was thinking, because there is another man just like him, very brilliant, very articulate. He has all the vision. And we've seen this in past, in, in past elections in Ghana. We've seen this for, for so long that people, will, people like Mr. Kofi will come. They have all the ideas. But at the end of the day, the people will not vote for them. So what I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting at the same time, I'm asking my brother, Mr. Kofi, why can't them, because all of them, I, I see that they have, we have almost like three or four independent candidates standing for the general elections, which at the end of the day, their impact will not lead them to, to, to give, give them the power to implement their visions. So why can't they come together, all these brilliant young guys, who, who have the ideas to make Ghana or Africa a better place. Why can't they come together, form a very strong, united political party to rescue power rather than forming all these so-called small, small parties, which at the end of the day, they wouldn't be able to have an impact in the general elections. But Mr. Kofi, I wish you all the best. I, I, I pray that at the end of the day, you guys will come together and then um, rescue power from these current corrupt leaders to be honest thank you very much thank you very much um mr coffee let's do it like this Um, that's how we did also because they just too many calls coming in um can you note down the question so that when i give yeah. you the floor you can just start answering it is that okay no that's beautiful go ahead okay because they're just too many we're not going to take one and answer one now you note his i'm going to pick up the next uh, uh, call and like i said please if if you call go straight to the question just go straight to the question so we can be able to take the calls um of the callers yeah all right we have this other one coming up hello 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 yes yeah am i on yes you're on you're on we're listening to you go ahead with your contribution or your questions hello mr coffee uh good afternoon and uh, we are very, very proud of um, your ambition to uh, rule Ghana. Uh, you know, we, some of us who are in the diaspora, are uh, listening to the calls of leaders like you, uh, who are calling on Africans to uh, be creators and not consumers. And so I just wanted to let you know that uh, there are many of us who are doing things, um, maybe you don't know about this yet, but... Um, we do have a platform which we would like you to run your campaign on. It's called Bomo Jami. Uh, it's a Facebook, it's a Facebook-like page that um, we Africans have built. Uh, we have been consumers and now we want to be producers. And so we've produced a Facebook-like page called Bomo Jami. I just sent it, I went to the website and I sent it to you. So you can take a look and see that we are also coming up. So also, we also have, um, We've created our own Zoom. It's called Umozinga, which you can use to do your campaigns. It's free. You can do it, use to do your campaign. So I just want to let you know that we are working to build Africa that we want. Correct. And uh, if we can start, if we can start by this, this oh. next, we'll bring it over to you. That will be a good thing. Okay. Thank you, sir. And good luck. We'll, we, we, we'll, we'll watch your campaigns. And if there's any way we can help, we are willing to help. 
Perfect. Bye, Bye. All right. Thanks you you knock it down. I can still send you the contacts um, at the end. We take the next call. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you. Now you see Thank that you. Africans are exactly in the same light. The population that you want, creators and inventors and not just consumers. Now you have a platform for your campaigns, just like any other platform. We want to push that agenda of young leadership on the continent. We are ready. So the next caller, hello. Hey. Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming. This is your Ghanaian sister, Shala speaking. Okay. Right. So, yeah. Shala, your so, volume is yeah, low. I'm excited. My volume? Yes, okay. please. Um, one second. Um, is it better? Better. Hello? Yes. Is it better? Okay. Better. All right. So, oh, thank you. Mr. Kofi Krantain, this is Shala speaking, your Ghanaian sister. Hello, Shala. I'm happy that you are on the show. I think you've got um, what I'm looking for, what I have been yearning for, the kind of leadership that I want in Africa, not just for Ghana, but the whole of African continent, because I'm a pro-African. And what I'm looking for is the Africa that will work for all of us, not the Africa with the, um, with the, with the I mean, I watering um, corrupt leaders that, that are good for nothing, including the AU itself. So I pray that you will become what I mean, what Ghanaians are looking for. But please, not just for Ghana. It's, it should be for the whole of African continent. Correct. Because we are looking for change. We are looking for United States of Africa. If China and America can do it, then we can do it. You understand? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of Gaddafi. We should emulate the concept of Gaddafi and also um, make the united Africa that we want, the education system, the health system, the social system that will work for us, for the vulnerable people, for the older people, and also for the disabled and, and, and I mean, and, and, and the less privileged. That is, the, but your initiative is actually good, and I pray that you get there, and who knows? With that, maybe that can push forward to the United Africa that we want. But Correct. there is one question for you, really, from me, and don't get offended with that. The question that I want to ask you, because there is a saying that says it's easy to say than done, right? So what tells me or what tells us that when you come to power, you won't even do worse than your predecessors? <laughs> because you are already mentioning, you are already mentioning partnering with China. Anything, see, Chinese can be a friend to any human nation. They are scavengers, trust me. Look at what they're doing in uh, uh, Namibia, in uh, Uganda, I mean, what you call that place again? Zambia, you know? Uh, Zamb Zambians are now foreigners on their own land. It is, you see, I sit down every day and I cry. And this thing you have said, I have also said it on this show, that we want someone who will come, and those leaders that are there currently, they will all be apprehended, put them in prison, and the prison key should be thrown in the ocean. You understand? Because they've done havoc to our land. They've sold our land to Chinese. So I'm happy that you you have this kind of initiative to come and implement in Ghana. But I'll be happy if you can answer the question that I asked. Okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank we you. take the next question. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Yes, we hear you. We hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kofi, I have this question. I was sure I have a question. Yes, Papa. Next question. Uh, uh, what is the difference between you and those leaders who they are, they are there now? This is the first question. And the second question is, who then about you? This is the yes. second question. And the third question well, is, well, wait, uh, what is, wait, Papa Kofi, what is the second question? Who are the ones backing him? Yeah. Okay, all right. Question number three. And the, and the third question is, um, which vision do you have from the, um, the, the African Union? Right? Okay. And the fourth question is uh, which is uh, his part with the 
Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? My name is Cook Fred Asari. Yes. I'm from Ghana. Okay. Um, I'm really happy to see you on this show. I've waited a long time to see Mr. Cranton on the show. Okay, so um, I'm in Italy right now and uh, I've been here for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question to um, Mr. Kofi is, um, I've been here for a long time, and one thing I've noticed is that um, all the policemen are actually not in the barracks. They are living in the communities. But when, whenever I go to Ghana, the police are not um, living in the communities. So um, when there is an emergency, you need to call them, and it will take a long time before they get to where you are. And um, what is he going to do to solve that issue? And that is my first one. And the second one is, I really want to know when the ROPA is coming up, because we need to vote. Mm -hmm. Those of us in the diaspora are not the ones that are going to vote. I don't think he can win the election, because those in Ghana are not that open-minded, and they cannot help us, because they are the ones that have been voting and doing and making the wrong choices. So I really want to know if um, he can give us some information on that. Okay. So um, that was my second question. And the last one, sorry for taking a lot of time. I didn't really want to It is okay, it's okay. The last one is um, how is he going to um, involve us in the economy? Okay. I don't know um, if you get my question. How is it going to involve those of us in the diaspora in the society? I mean, in Ghana, because duty in Ghana is something else. Like when you take something that you can't even pay for the duty. So I really want to know how he's going to involve us in the economy and um, how he's going to help us with the duty. That's all I'm, I'm trying to do. I want to know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you. We're taking the next caller. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes. Um, this off. Also, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kofi. Um, my questions are very straight. But first, uh, let me start by observing that uh, philosophy is not judged by its correctness, but at how it changes the course of history. Uh, it, that you've launched yourself, uh, whether you win or lose already, you are changing the course of history of Ghana. Yes. Um, as you prepare for your course at Center for Africa Volunteers, we are looking forward to uh, teaming up with you on legislations that will create a room for other youths like you across the continent. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've realized and we've evidently seen is that uh, we have all people, uh, almost the ages of our ancestors, ever on the ballot 
you get a person vying almost four times and uh, either winning or failing continuously, thereby blocking young people like you from rising uh, to, to, to the offices. So um, your focus is in Ghana, but I implore you to also focus on Africa, mm -hmm. that uh, we help in legislations uh, to ensure that uh, a person only buys once or twice is that if you fail, the exit political team. If that is legislated, then even your course would have been very easy in Ghana, but uh, let's to be assured uh, that you must prepare for a heavy burden, but uh, you got to uh, put out the spirit. Number one, um, what is your strategy for food security in Ghana and by extension in Africa? Uh, our people will die of hunger and our people go hungry and it is not a good thing. So what is your strategy for food security? Um, think for, uh, think, uh, don't, don't, don't think of course only in Ghana. Um, in your strategy also, um, we are pan Africanist, and uh, there is nothing for us without us. So when you're in Ghana and you're not thinking about the Africa, be assured the imperialists might use the hands, the dirty hands of other African leaders to lead you off. So I seduce you to think of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. That is. That is hard. That is hard. That is interesting. And thank you for so much. Okay, I think we would please. Um, can you just hold on with the calls? Let first of all clear what we have on the desk, and then we can take um further questions. Are we okay, Mr. Kofi? All right, so real quick, um, because I know there are a bunch of questions. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Uh, so uh, last question, yes, uh, we're not doing anything, uh, not considering Africa as a whole. We understand that everything is with the one consciousness that we need to bring Africa together. Uh, now, in bringing Africa together, we realize, though, that first, everything that we do in Ghana and using Ghana as a template, as a blueprint, has to, we have to do it very, very well. Once we do it very, very well, then we could use that, that blueprint for the whole of Africa. So it's with Africa in our consciousness, but we need to do very well what we do in Ghana first. Uh, as far as food security, yes, you're absolutely right. One of the things that we're going to do, actually one of the top uh, things uh, on our list that we need to do is um, integrated and mechanized agriculture and food security systems. So we do realize that a country that has no food security um, uh, cannot brag about uh, national security. You don't control your food. Uh, so we want to elevate uh, the thinking of uh, the foods that we consume, all the garbage that's being shipped into Africa in Ghana. I know that for a fact. Uh, we have uh, an agency called the Food and Drug Authority. Um, they are a toothless lion, just like all the other toothless lion agencies in all the African nations. And they allow garbage to be shipped in from all these countries, especially hybridized wheat and uh, all these things that causes Africans to develop uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, uh, we are going to cut that nonsense. We are going to cultivate the land. And then we are going to develop agriculture uh, in Ghana, I mean, uh, in talking about Ghana, because I've studied the Ghana map uh, uh, intensely. Uh, so we're going to create food security systems by having, uh, like I said before, I think I said that a little bit, uh, we're going to have model farms, uh, uh, nurseries, uh, we're going to train people specifically for different crops in different regions, have government approved uh, storage facilities where people who uh, develop crops who just bring it in to a government facility and get paid for it uh, and then that goes into silos of uh, you know uh, storage and preservation uh, uh, systems uh, and these are all going to be government handled we're going to have some part going into the private sector but we're going to train people we have to make sure you specialize and we're going to develop the arteries 
the distribution lines. We don't have distribution lines in Ghana when it comes to food. So all the food gets rotten uh, in, in the, the regions where it's, it's, it's uh, uh, grown. Uh, we're going to change that. Okay. Um, uh, when it comes to involving the diaspora, yes, you're right. Everything we're going to do, we are going to recruit the best of the best from the diaspora and bring them in to Ghana uh, and put them to work because our standard is very high. Uh, and we, uh, I mean, there are great people in Ghana also, uh, but uh, again, we're going to create a secretariat where uh, uh, diaspora uh, 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 wealth, ca uh, human capital comes in with ease. Uh, right now, this bottlenecked. Uh, it's almost like they don't want to see diaspora uh, knowledge uh, interventions. Uh, we're going to open uh, the floodgates for diaspora wealth, capital, human capital to come in, and we're going to have a secretariat that's going to specifically integrate people into the system. As far as ROPA is concerned, representation of the People's Amendment Act, yes, you are right. Uh, we challenged that. Um, we went to Ghana. We won a case against uh, the Electoral Commission. But the government of Ghana is very reluctant because they know exactly what will happen if they allow for Ghanaians abroad to vote. So they have sat on it and they have played pussyfooting on this ROPA deal and they haven't made it come to work. Uh, we're going to make sure it's going to be one of the first things that it's implemented fully by the Electoral Commission when we get in there. Um, uh, 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 policing, as far as policing and communities, of course, listen, uh, po police, uh, we, this whole idea of having police live in barracks is so old fashioned. Uh, we're gonna scrap that. We're gonna build, uh, 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 just like with everybody else, uh, we're gonna have the police live in beautiful, well-furnished homes, one of the things we need to realize is we need to take care of our peace officers. Uh, very little is done, and that's why security is always compromised. We need to take care of our teachers. We need to take care of our health care people. We need to take care of our peace officers, build first-class facilities to, with, uh, for them to live in the communities that everybody else lives in. And the reason is it's better policing. When you have a police uh, man or woman live in a community with everybody else, it's very easy for them to identify something that's going wrong because they live with us and they know all the, uh, you know, all the, all, all the people who are the troublemakers and they can even have conversations with them and by building relationships with them, it actually reduces crime. So we're going to integrate police residences in our communities. Um, talk about language. What type of language? Well, right now, because we're an English colony, we speak English. We're not going to go to Ghanaian languages like that because it won't make any sense. You need to gradually merge into. But what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that for you to be able to graduate and have a degree and fully go through a matriculation, you need to have one Ghanaian language that you specialize in, that you can pass and matriculate through a process. Uh, one Ghanaian language, and we're going to incorporate the Ghanaian languages into our everyday lives. It's not going to be done like this because it will disrupt the system because right now everything is in English. We're going to always keep English at the background and gradually merge all the different languages into what we are doing. A um, uh, vision for United Nations. Well, like I said, oh, well, before that it says, uh, well, what I'm going to do with Jerry John Rawlings. Well, it's not what I'm going to do with Jerry John Rawlings. It's what the system is going to do with everybody who has ever uh, 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 walked the face of Ghana. If we could go back long enough and we could find that you have done something right, we will praise you and we will thank you and we will make you feel good. We will commend you. But if you've done something wrong, there are quite, uh, consequences. So. Uh, it's as simple as that. If, if we find that anybody, we don't care if it's a president, for one of the things we're going to revoke, get out of the system, is the exemption with the presidents that presidents could come in and do whatever they want and nobody, the law that does not permit for you to prosecute them. Well, we're going to scrap it. First date. 
uh, I'm in office, it's going to be uh, something we put in Parliament to scrap that and change that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and as we go through the constitutional overhaul, the, those are the things we're going to take out of the Constitution. Because if a president commits crime, guess what? Uh, we need to hold their feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. um, the vision for African Union. Like I said, we will go to African Union and we're going to have a serious conversation. And mm -hmm. it's going to be a simple conversation. If the kitchen is too hot, get out. Simple. And I don't care if they don't invite me back into the African Union. We're not going there to sit. Listen, this is not about just being a president who to, no, we, we're going to thrust change into Africa, whether you like it or not. So if you are the African leader who thinks you're going to resist, well, guess what? The bullet has left the nozzle. Brace for impact. It's coming. Okay. So yes, we're going to make serious recommendations to the business of the day of African Union because uh, it needs to change. African Union there is just it is so weak, weak. Uh, I don't even trust me. Don't get me started on African Union, but it's a weak organization. We need to make it powerful again. Um, so that's as far as that is concerned. Uh, I had a question about uh, da, da, da. Uh, the lady who spoke there. Uh, uh, there were so many things she was saying, but the, uh, the, uh, I couldn't hear her properly. But I know Charlotte was asking me uh, 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 what are the first things that we're going to do. Um, one of the first things we're going to do uh, in terms of uh, with the tribes and stuff is listen. The reason why we have tribi the tribal differences is because, um, like I said, they've been deprived. If you come in and your job is to do what's right with everybody else for the country, uh, I don't think you're going to have to worry about tribal this and tribal this. This whole idea of uh, we vote around tribal uh, lines. Yes, I know yeah, there are people who believe in that, people who practice that, but we coming in to, we, one of the things we're going to do is also change the psyche, change a lot of things about how things are done, uh, you mm -hmm. know? So uh, we, we, it's not about tribe. It's about purely based on merit. If you could, and listen, if you voted for tribe, on tribal lines, look at what that has done for you. Do you like what is happening in Ghana now? It's a simple question. If you love what you have experienced in the last 28 years, go, by all means, go vote for these uh, clueless, uh, incompetent twins. If you don't, then time for change. It's as simple as that. We're not sugarcoating stuff, and we're not here to babysit either. Get with it. This is where why we're here. We're here for change. If you're ready for the change, vote the right person in, and let's get this thing done. Okay, so we're not sugarcoating anything. Um, uh, uh, I know uh, there's a gentleman who came in and talked about you guys have a Zoom and you have all these other resources set up. Well, we want to work with you. One of the things we're going to do, Annie, is we want to project our African uh, leaders and, and leadership in every aspect of our lives. We, there are so many Africans who have mastered the art of doing things, but you know what? They're in, in some village, nobody even heard about them. We want to put them on the platforms. Those right. are the people we're going to champion, not... not 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 presidents or ministers. No, you're there to do a job and get paid for it. But we want to create a platform for people who have who are great at what they do to excel. You know, um, and then I think the first gentleman had talked about uh, there are people like myself who are talking. Well, listen to me. You are listening? We have yeah. formed a coalition. Okay, to the gentleman who said, I think you need to all come back. We already formed it, so get with it. Let's move on. We formed a coalition. Go read the papers, and you will find out. Uh, so, any you familiar that we formed a coalition, correct? I, I think I sent you the video. Yes, yes you sent me the video, okay. and uh, fortunately, I didn't talk about it, but that's a very uh, applaudable move because, I mean, divided we are not. But that, coal uh, that coalition, could you just say a little bit about it? Like, well, you know, five, 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 five candidates. Uh, uh, Onipaya de Te, uh, Marik Kofi Gan, Kali mm -hmm. Morgan, uh, Ofori Ampofo, and myself, we have come together, we all independent aspirants, we've come together to say, you know what, enough of the, enough 
uh, it's not about us personally going in. It's about us coming together for Ghana. So because of that, we have pushed away our, uh, and again, we're not under any illusion. We know uh, that it's, it's challenging by ourselves. So we have pushed everything aside and uh, as a team, we have come together to form one union. Uh, and at some point, uh, the right candidate is gonna emerge from that. We're gonna select a candidate to lead and everybody's gonna put their, uh, their, 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 their resource and their power and their wisdom behind this candidate uh, to face uh, the uh, current government. Okay. I think one question that is coming up now, uh, the lines are open again. Some of the questions, I couldn't take them because he had to answer this one. This one was, these ones are okay, but one question that keeps coming up from the public is, what about healthcare? What are your plans for healthcare? Oh, we're going to revamp healthcare. I mean, healthcare is a staple. Listen, everybody talks about healthcare. You know what is healthcare? Portable water. Just good drinking water. If you give your people good drinking water, Annie, you give them a place, a decent place to lay their head. There is sanitation is under control. Mm -hmm. There is an open defecation as Ghana is the number one in the whole world for open defecation. Annie, I bet you didn't know that. That's disgusting. I right? didn't know that. Honestly. Okay. So don't tell anybody I said that, okay? But uh, so, okay, so if you take care of water, you gave them a place to sleep, you gave them good, somebody talked about food security. We control our own food. It's not garbage from all over the world being dumped on Ghana. Mm -hmm. Then healthcare, that's where healthcare begins. Yeah. And then you put in a little bit of education. 90% of the people are healthcare solid. That's how you begin healthcare. Not just putting together empty facilities with machines that you don't have drinking water to run under these machines to wash your hands. What kind of nonsense is that? You've put together all the first class hospitals. There's no water. I go to 37 military hospital. They have a barrel sitting on some blocks in the ICU, any, and they, you have to use a, a cup to pitch the water. And, and how do you wash your hands and Correct. run the water on your hands at the same time? It means your hands has to go in a, come on. And you call this a hospital, get out of here. This is, you can't talk healthcare till you have good running systems. That's what we're talking about. We're gonna run the uh, a Western allopathic medicine with the traditional medicine and make sure we benefit from uh, the Western medicine, we benefit from uh, our uh, uh, local uh, 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 medicine. You with me? We're gonna create systems where everybody, if you're taking care of one other person other than yourself and you can pay for it, you are on some registry and you go through certification every two years to make sure that you meet the grade or you get wiped out and if you dare go do anything in terms of healing someone and you're not certified to do that, we're not even gonna waste time and have you, you going straight to jail. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance across the board at everything. We have to change the mindset and we have to do it abruptly. All we, right. we, don't, we don't have time to waste for people who, we, no, we're not coming to talk. We, we're not coming to dance. We come to act. We want results. Correct. I like that. I like that. Let me take these questions uh, that are coming up again. Please just note them down. Hello? Hello, how are you? Fine. Good hey, evening. Uh, uh, yeah, good evening. This is uh, Dr. Owen Appleton. I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Ellie, I uh, wanted to find out from a uh, gentleman there. Um, I've been actually very you know, interested about the topic that I did brought up pretty nice and uh i wanna uh, i have actually a few questions that i wanted to ask from uh i mean to him so that he may actually uh, i help me to you know to to to, to you know come up with an answer on that uh the first question i wanted to find that uh why is it still uh, difficult for african to 
you know, uh, to, to, to do with the issue of, uh, you know, patronage, you know, where we, we Africans don't, you know, patronize each other, you know, in terms of business. When it comes to business, you find some uh, African people do not actually trust each other. Uh, they prefer to go to a, a Caucasian uh, and they feel that, you know, what Caucasian has is more, you know, valuable or is more quality than, uh, you know, what a, 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 a black man has. And then another question is uh, how can we deal with the issue of nepotism in, in, uh, in, in African, you know, uh, politics? Two issues that uh, questions that I wanted to find that to ask tonight. Um, what is the second question you talked about? What nepotism? Yes, yes. Okay. How can we deal with that? Because we find that a lot into politics when a uh, president has to, you know, be elected. Uh, they have to choose a certain, you know, kind of, uh, you know, tribe or people that the uh, previous president that was there has to choose another person that is maybe from a family or a friend or a person that he is familiar to, something like that. All right. Okay. Thank you for the questions. And, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, Kofi? All right. So, real quick, the first question is No, 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 wait. I just want to, what tribe do you come from? Probably. Let's. I'm from the east. Okay, from the east. What tribe is the present president? Uh, <laughs> it's so funny. Same place. He's from Machim and the place that I'm from also. Okay. I mean, that was just for information's sake. Go ahead. With answer. All right. So the first question is this: um, the the listen. We have created. We have institutionalized substandardness. Okay, so it means everything that we do, and it comes from the leaders, bad leadership, poor leadership is what's caused this thing. We don't do things properly. We have baked things, we do things haphazardly, and our whole culture and acceptance have been to accept things because, you know, God, God will take care of us. You know, God, nonsense. God doesn't have time for people who don't use your brains. He gave us brains to use. Use it. Don't waste my time. That's what God is telling us. And that's why I'm here to tell you. Okay? Time for change. Substandardness comes from weak thinking. Okay? We have to start doing things well. We have to elevate our game. Now, the reason why you would go to Caucasian and not come to me is because I don't do things properly. Did you see did you find us build any cars? No. But that's why you go to Germany and get a Mercedes and a BMWs and all the other cars, right? You go to UK and you get the Range Rovers, and right? Well, because they have built the cars. We don't do anything. We we just wait till we get the canned tomatoes. You know, canned tomatoes. We eat a lot of canned tomatoes, and then our kids make holes in the canned tomatoes and use them for cars. That's what we do. You see them, any? You see the kids around the town, any laughing? <laughs> so this is this is what we do. We have to elevate our game, and it starts from having the right leadership, leadership with a vision, so that we don't have to patronize anybody buying their cars. We, we don't have leadership academies. We don't have academies around institutions around our countries that is uh, uh, training people, developing people how to perfect an art. Where is the research and development centers around the country? We don't have any. You know what we have? A big parliament. And people sit there, drink, talk nonsense, go home and get paid, come back and do the same thing. And we elect them into power and we think things are going to change. Insanity. Doing same things over and over again and expecting different results. It's not going to happen. This is it. 2020. Get them out of here. Let's come in and change the system for good. Second question. Um, Nepotism comes out of not having systems. You know, just I uh, think last week, uh, our Minister of Finance uh, announced that the public sector had lost 3.1 billion CDs, 3.1 billion CDs, about eight, seven hundred million dollars from the public sector. You know how that was? It came about, and his excuse that there are no 
uh, he says, practices and culture or some nonsense. Guess what? The reason is because there are no systems. Systems are institutional infrastructures that you lay. And then when you lay an institutional infrastructure, you put on top of the institutional infrastructure systems. The systems are three prong. You have the objective, the core, then you have the mechanical part of the system, then you have one thing Africans never include in anything they do, discipline. Discipline in English is called accountability. That we don't do accountability with anything. So how on earth do you expect something, somebody to do stuff, you don't go check it, you don't know how, how it works, but you somehow expect it to meet a standard. It doesn't, and we accept it, and it keeps going. So you need to lay an institutional infrastructure, and then you put the mechanical system on, and then you need to create a system by which the system runs. And that's a distributed ledger technology. You know what a distributed ledger technology is? It's something that is algorithmic that develops itself and everywhere it goes, it registers. So you cannot, I cannot steal money and change the books because when it registers algorithmically, it registers at multiple places, everything you do, so nobody can steal from the process. That is corruption in itself. That's the biggest thing eating Africa away. And these coolest leaders don't, it's, well, it's hard for me to say they don't have a clue because if they wanted to buy something to stop the corruption, they would. But because they enjoy the benefits of the corruption, they don't. Okay, so yeah. that's where, when, in a place where you don't have nepotism, you know what you have? Culture comes in. Anything they do, you know what they do, Annie? They go and call the chief. You do something and I fire you, they bring me a goat and a chief to beg me and give me a goat. I see if I had a goat soup, pepper soup, right? Everything <laughs> goes away. I know you like pepper soup, but let's keep the focus. <laughs> this is <laughs> Kofi, let's take this other question, please. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, good evening, Sister Suzanne. Good evening. Good evening this is Tracy calling from the UK. Um, I have a question for Mr. Kofi and I do have a suggestion. I know someone has mentioned uh, something about healthcare. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is, uh, first I would like to uh, probably rely on experience that I had today, which was uh, where I work, I was shop, uh, listing applications uh, from nurses abroad and within the UK and found out that there were lots of applications from Ghana and from Nigeria. I'm trying to find out how can we, because you mentioned about um, Africa not being able to manage, you know, outbreaks and uh, we don't even have a response team. So my question or maybe suggestion, if I might put it that way, is that I think it is uh, vital that we try to look for competent nurses, African nurses uh, around the globe so that we can create a response team for outbreak in Africa so that we can also teach the young nurses in Africa. We don't have to wait for uh, foreign aids before we can respond when we have simple outbreaks and we have all our competent nurses. I've received applications today from Nigeria, from Ghana, and I, you know, it will work in my head. And my manager who is white couldn't understand why I just couldn't feel comfortable. But I was like asking myself, this is, this were like qualified nurses. These are not like newly qualified. These are people willing to relocate with their families or join them later just to look for the greener posture. And I'm asking myself, what is it we can do in order to better our healthcare? But the first important thing I think we should do is to have or create, just like you have Medicine Sound Frontier, we have a lot of competent nurses. All we need to do is to bring back our skills, empower some of them, and look for sponsors so that we can have our own non-governmental organization that will respond for outbreaks within Africa. So um, 
I'm really happy to, you know, work with anyone who is ready to do this. I do have a group of Pan-Africanists here in the UK, which we are, we've created. So we are part of PLO Foundation Lumumba. And uh, the aim of this group is to try to recruit or get as many Pan-Africanist men and women as we can so that we can collectively together start thinking of what skills have we got that we can now start transforming and infusing those skills back into the youth in Africa. And also, how can we approach the young black children in the UK to talk about gun crimes, knife crimes, because majority of these things are happening to our youth and so this is this is what i'm trying to coordinate within the uk but i'm very focused on the rapid response team in case of an outbreak so that we can you know fight this without foreign aids thank you okay thank you kofi oh man listen this it breaks my heart it really breaks my heart annie listen to me i hear you know I'm anytime, here. anytime I hear people talk about non-governmental organizations, it's only in Africa that they have NGOs. Do you realize Correct. that? Because the right. you realize it's non-governmental because the governmental doesn't work. Do you realize yeah. that? Everything she said, oh, we need to train our nurses and bring them out there, da, 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 da. get the government get the leadership to work because if the leadership work and we had the facilities to train the nurses actually pay the nurses because in ghana they go three months four months sometimes the nurses they inject in somebody and they're looking somewhere they they mm -hmm. inject in somebody you know why because they they have lost the flavor of serving correct they, they, they don't pay them you have Mahama now talking about paying the nurses who sh he didn't pay when he was it was in his administration for months he didn't pay them teachers don't get paid nurses don't get paid why so what I'm saying is is we don't need to create listen Africa listen to me no more NGOs we need to stop that nonsense it's weakness it's weakness of thought we don't need any more NGOs in Africa we have enough when, listen. I worked on Wall Street. Listen to me. Any, when you go on Wall Street and you talk about NGO, they laugh. Oh, the African is here again. NGO. They laugh yeah. at you. What what is NGO? What kind of nonsense is that? Get the governments to work so you would not need an NGO. What what tell me why you need an NGO? If go to Sweden and see how many NGOs they have. Go to Japan and see if they have any NGOs. Go to Singapore and see if they have NGOs. If it's an NGO, it's for fun. We do NGO for, <laughs> we do NGOs for survival. What kind of nonsense is that? It's weakness. Africa, enough of the NGOs. No more NGOs. If you hear anybody talking NGOs, walk the other way. We are walking to the parliament office of the president and we need to, listen, listen to me. You don't need an NGO, you need this. This is what you need. You need to stamp and vote and get this useless governments out of the way. So you can have a functioning government that comes in and puts in systems so you wouldn't have a need for an NGO. Tell me if I'm crazy, Any? You are not. Absolutely not. You know me. I'm your person. We are one on one no. on this. No, no. Don't be my person for now. Just be my <laughs> enemy for now. I just want you to tell me, Kofi, you are wrong. We don't. <laughs> Honestly, jokes apart, jokes apart. These are things that we are saying. Any country that is 60% uh, uh, reliable on NGO is the weakest, the weakest kind of economy. <laughs> And now if you look at if you look at I'm talking about 60%, but if you look at Africa, I mean everything NGO everybody is wakes up NGO. Anytime, listen, I I hear NGO, I wanna puke. I don't want to hear NGO. Are you serious? Let's start something to get these weak of governments out. 
so we can install agencies that work so we wouldn't have to worry about NGOs begging everywhere. NGO is having a little calabash going around. Oh, I'm African, you know, Africans are really poor. And you know, it, it, the sickening thing is we actually create a narrative for the NGO. You no know, Africans right. don't have any, you know, Africans are really hungry. So go to the NGO websites and read their objectives and their vision. It's sickening. It's like accepting that you are a weaker, inferior race. God help me. God Beg forgot about us. You are a beggar. Come on, get that nonsense out. We don't need NGOs. Come on. We this is a oh my god. Any what's the All next right. question? Yeah, yeah. Next question. Next question. Please calm down. Hello. Hello, good evening. Good evening, sister. Good evening. Kingdom. Okay, Maria. Um, yeah, my question is, um, if like he becomes a president, um, I'm, 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 when, I'm, when, I'm, when, anyway. when I become a president, when I become a president, president not if. what is he going to do about Africa unity? Because um, the youth really, really wants to be united. So, like, what is he going to do, especially? like um especially um things like the, the the monetary aspect like that you know the bringing the money together you know youth together the, the economy of africa together like what is he going to do about that and um another thing is um my another contribution that i want to make is about you know to be honest with you, um, religion, religion has caused a lot of havoc in Africa. Really, I don't know if he's, he is a Christian or not, but like religion has caused a lot of problems in Africa. This is the problems that we need to tackle. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yes. We, have, we, are, we, we as Africans are hundred and hundred years behind. Why can't we just go back to our ancestors for me personally i believe that our ancestors are angry with us we need to forget about this white man religion and go back to our african religion for us to go further we have to go back to the ancestors so thank you very much this is my contribution thank you over to you kofi you got right. it so, no questions. okay so um okay so like i said earlier okay for African, for us to have African unity, you got to understand that each government in every country has to be functional. We don't have that. Okay, so it, you don't want to create a system where the strength of Africa would be at a point where its weakest country would be. So you want to elevate the whole of Africa. And this is why you have to call all the leadership of Africa, you have to call them uh, to, to a meeting, you have to call them to the test, uh, you have to call them to elevate their game. And, uh, but you have to first prove that you are worthy of that call. And that's why we have to do it in Ghana first. See, if, if you do it in your country, then you can hold everyone accountable that this is what I have done, do it. But till you do it, you don't have any rights to talk to somebody and say, let's come together and do it. Because they, it, the most difficult thing to sell somebody who has not seen success is success. Correct. You Agreed. see, it's, it's a lot easier when they have tasted success and they know success, then when you sell them on success, they know what to expect, so they know why it's worthy for them to fight. Mm -hmm. But So what we need to do is to create a working Ghana first. Now, I'm not saying everybody waits for Ghana. We could do that concurrently, but what I'm saying is because I only have the jurisdiction of Ghana to change, we're gonna come in with our leadership team to change things in Ghana. And then we're gonna call the African leaders and say, look at what we've been able to do. There's no excuse not to do yours as we have done ours. And then by everybody doing, we will elevate 
the whole of Africa. It's as simple as that. Uh, the other, uh, the lady was asking about what we're going to do about religion, and uh, you know, religion has caused a lot of fights. And listen, America is more sectarian than any other country that I know. Do you see fights? You don't see fights. You know why you don't see fights? There are systems. When there are systems and people are not living in poverty, religion has its place and it takes its place. And it's not in chaos or in conflict with anything else. If you doubt me, take a look at all the other nations where they live well. They don't have a problem with religion, whatever religion. Some don't even have religion. So it's not religion we are pointing to, is the problem of not having the visionary leaders to build a system where people are living above poverty lines. You see, when people are hungry, even when you tell them a joke, they're not laughing. When people are full and happy, you could say the most idiotic thing and they love you for it because they happy. That's how life works. That's or, or 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 it could also be that because of the hopelessness of people. Oh boy, people let me tell you. Coming up so much like much rooms because people don't just have a way out. They Listen, just have to bury and believe in nothing. Let me tell you, Ani, this is so sad. And in Ghana, the reason why. Uh, suicides have gone up is because these children who are on drugs uh, and they are killing themselves is because there there's no hope. Hopelessness yes. is 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 killing these kids, and it's a sad place to be when you have a country like Ghana where it has all the resources in the world and then some. You would have children die of hopelessness, and we have time bombs where. Kids are giving birth to children. We have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the population under two is 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 the same population over sixty five. Population under two. We are heading into an explosion, and our government's only focus is coronavirus. How convenient! Coronavirus has never been Africa's problem. If African leaders want to find a problem, let them go and take a bite at malaria. Ghana, in Ghana alone, 100,000 people die from malaria since coronavirus in the last three or four months, since March. How many people have died? Less than 100, right? Less than 100, or maybe even 100. Even if it were 200, how is that compared to 8,300 people dying from malaria every month. And you still have the mosquitoes flying around. And they don't that. even no. And you have these filth, filthy gutters. Correct. And, 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 and it's breeding mosquitoes. And then you take a billion dollars from the World Bank and say you're going to fight coronavirus. What happened, say, to, what happened to malaria? No, nobody cares about it. It's like when you die from coronavirus, then it's a special death. But when you die from mosquitoes, oh, well, you're on your own. Nobody cares yeah. about you. Correct. What kind of sickening mentality is that? And then we give them a pass. They do this, and we, 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 we call them heroes. I, they, they, they don't have any, they, they, don't, they can't think. They don't have the capacity to think. You have 100,000 people dying, and you have... 200 people dead. If 200 people died every month for the whole year, it would be 1,200. Let's say 2,000, God forbid. And 100,000 people a year, 2,000 people a year, and you will take a billion dollars from World Bank and a couple of millions from the American government to fight corona. No regard to malaria. Meanwhile, meanwhile, what, what, what blows my mind is we have a ministry called the Ministry of Health. We have an agency called the Food and Drug Authority that allows all the garbage to flow in into Ghana, and that's actually what's making people sick. 
you know, the biggest thing you could, you, could, you could have, you can embolden yourself with in fighting corona is your immune system, Annie. Correct. We know that, right? So yeah. if you bring it in foods that's going to make wean away the strength of your immune system, does it not allow coronavirus to knock you off? Oh, yeah. So if you had just common sense, would you not start at a place where you had control in bringing in all the foods that's making our people sick, at least first? Come on, this is not rocket science. This is not. And then we have a Ministry of Health, and they come there and stand on a podium and give us numbers on how coronavirus is going. Meanwhile, all the foods are coming in. People are dying from methanol, methanol, using methanol for alcohol is the biggest thing in Africa now. And our leaders don't even know. Instead of using ethanol, most people, and you know what gets me? It, they are foreigners bringing methanol into the country, using it for alcohol for our people. Mm -hmm. And the, our, our, our leaders don't know that. They don't even have the data for that information in Ghana. And it's killing people because all you do is you go to all the uh, 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 centers for uh, kidney dialysis and you see all these young kids who could be doing something magical for the country going through dialysis because they drunk some wrong alcohol and it's killing our boys and girls and they don't even have a solution for it. And then they're going to take a billion dollars and go fight for uh, uh, coronavirus. Coolest science-based, data-proven, human-centered leadership. This is the new way for Africa. Let's go. Yes. Um, I think we are really, we're really exhausted. Um, and um, when I said exhausted, it's like you've actually, I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt about this. Um, I want to say this to Ghanaians and I want to say this to African young people. It is up to you. And so when I hear um, we saying, if you are going to be voted, and now we asked, um, um, what are you going to do about a united Africa? And we ask questions like, it's not even going to work because, you know, it is up to us. It is up to us. Leadership is Mr. Kofi not going to do all the things. He needs me and you. He needs Ghana youth. He needs Africans youth to stand up. What he does, like he's been saying, it's not short of the laws. We know even the African Union, we're talking about all these objectives and laws are there. But the mm. problem, like we say, the toothless bulldog that cannot bark and not all dogs that bark bite. So it means they need the kind of leadership that will wake them up, that will spark them, not spark them or just clear them like uh, Maponga Joshua said, we need to just put them in a boat and just, I don't know, drown them somewhere or whatever. What kind of eat that we want, it now is the ball on our court. For a young leader, for our leaders to stand up and give us the dreams and give us the objectives, it's not going to happen when we start doubting. It's not going to happen when we say, mm, if you, oh, we know it's from a tribe. And I asked that question purposefully. What tribe does it come from and which tribe is in existence? So now, Ghana, it is you to prove to Mr. Kofi Kuateng that, hey, we need you. It is both ways. We, we can put all the plans, but if you don't make it work, if we are so desperate in asking, or always doubting that it's it's not gonna work. He's not going to do all the voting. He's not going to. And the question that our brother from Italy asked about the diaspora, diaspora, you probably might not vote. I don't know the constitution in Ghana, whether you have a dual nationality where you can vote or stuff like that. But in even without that, now we're talking about technology. You can influence that vote if you mm -hmm. want it. If we sit and we're so comfortable in our comfort zone, nothing is going to happen. We have to make it work. We have to push the leaders that we're seeing, give them the objective that, yes, this is what we want. Because who are they building for? Mr. Kofi would sit here, relax, and he's comfortable. What is he building for? When we say we want to give the young people the chance, the, the, the Ghanaians the chance, the African people the chance, 
doesn't mean that we're going to go into the same dormant system of telling you what you need to do. Now, the game change is you know exactly what you need to do, but you, you because of the kind of leadership that we have, you were not able to do it. Now, what about this now? You have all it takes for you to act. But now what we start hearing, oh, maybe I can't vote. I want you to tell me what I need to do. You know what? You should be now sitting up to say, this is what we are going to do for you to put this agenda forward. That's the spirit that we're talking about here. And I want to thank all of you that have been watching. And I want to thank our guest um, uh, particularly for being here because we have to take leave of him now. And also we have to be rounding up um, to end this stream. We're really 2020 and to air. And because, of course, we took the first 10, 15, 20 minutes um, um, uh, to, to be labeled uh, the sad situation on the continent right now where we just lost... Uh, a young president, uh, um, Excellency Pierre Nkuruziza, I will not really end the show again without wishing our condolence mm -hmm. up of our guests and, and all Africans about this uh, uh, tragic um, um, uh, situation. And one of the things that uh, we know about this president in his private life, we know he was a born again Christian. He was a born again Christian in mm, his private life. And Secondly, he was a soccer player and he's put up this kind of structures that are really going on now in the Burundi that we want. So, I mean, I just want to stress like those that were just joining in that today is a sad day for us uh, from the continent to lose a leader, to lose a leader and a young one, of course, a young one, of course, it makes it even more painful, especially the fact that he was also going out. He's already gone out, as a matter of fact, uh, because we heard that Burundi voted and they have a new president. So, yeah, our hearts, our prayers goes out to the people of Burundi and to Africans worldwide, and particularly to the family. You are in our prayers. And now, um, one more word, Mr. Kofi, before we take leave of you today, because we will want to follow up this um, uh, this new leadership that we're having on. We're going to rally all the new visionaries and, the, and, and, and Africans that are aspiring for the kind of leadership that we are to work, to work and put this action plan into work or to put your words or to elevate our commander in chief into action. I think that is what we are talking from the Pan-African Daily TV. And you know what we do? We talk. We talk and we okay. have you explain your objectives to the, the audience worldwide that is watching. And it should not be the idea of Ghana alone. You people are already asking too much. And so it means we need to bring too much. We're talking about to the entire diaspora on the continent. We're talking about to the Jamaicans, to the Caribbean, to the IT, and because we are connected now. We are a platform and a voice for Africans worldwide. Please, each and everyone encourage every youth. This is the kind of leadership we want and put a strategy and lay it in front of um, uh, Mr. Kofi Corante and say, this is what we want you to do and this is how we're going to do it. This is the kind of leadership that we want from you young people. And that brings me to the PLO mentorship conference that is coming up on the 27th of June, 27th of June. And the theme is going to be redefining Pan-Africanism, the role of young people. Exactly how I wish we would have had that conference before we would have you here on this podium. But you know what, Mr. Kofi, you're going to come back after this conference because we want to keep touch with you, how the process is going out there in Ghana, how are Africans reacting to the first, to the first diaspora candidate that is standing up to say, you know what, we have to be the game changer. I want to be the commander in chief on the continent of Africa, starting with Ghana. A word of closing remark from your side, Mr. Kofi. Well, uh, any, I, I really thank you. I thank your um, listeners, but the question you asking me should not be, Kofi, why do you want to be president for Ghana? That which should be said to me is, Kofi, you must be the president of Ghana. Yes. If the people watching this are paying attention, serious attention, they will know that our country is in crisis. 
we have a one-shot kill deal. That means we have to take one more shot to come 2020. If we miss the shot, Ghana might fail. We're going to go into a failed state because we owe so much money and all the leadership is doing is racking up on debt for the next generation. That's not even born yet. We have a major situation. The country is on a life support, Annie, mm -hmm. and we need to rescue it or we're going to flatline. And when it flatlines, we will can do everything, but the country will be dead. It will be a failed state. Now, let me tell you something, Annie. There are over 770,000 Chinese residents in Ghana. 770,000. Jeez. Annie, I don't know if you ever saw the picture of the poor African child who, out of hunger, had come to their last breath. And right next to the child, that's, it, it starts wallowing down to death. There was a vulture standing close by waiting for the child to take its last breath so it can start yeah. feeding on the child. Mm -hmm. Ghana is that child. All the foreign nationals are the vulture. The foreign nationals are, is the vulture standing next to the child. And they are waiting for Ghana to fail. They are on standby. They realize how shaky Ghana's economy, Ghana's people, and Ghana's fate is. And the moment that line flatlines, they take over Ghana. And like I think Gambia now, it would be controlled. It would be another colony for another nation. And it would be sad, Annie, that Ghanaians will come to Ghana on a visit. And when they get to the immigration, a foreigner will be in a immigration booth asking them how long they're coming for. And they would say six months. And the foreign national will tell them, oh, no. You, we can't allow you in this in our country for six months. We'll give you two months. Make sure you're out of this country in two months. But that day is coming if we do not act. And the only way we're going to be able to stop and reverse that if we pick leaders who are competent and functional. If the leadership is going to be science-based, loving, caring, competent, data-driven government. If we do not do that, that day is right on the horizon where it's going to hit us like a ton of bricks. Like I said, the bullet left the nozzle. And the only thing we could do now is brace for impact. Now, depending on how we vote in 2020, we may fall and never be able to get up when that bullet hits us. We have a chance that when the bullet hits us, because we are standing well and we are holding on to something firm, we will, even if we go down, we'll be able to pick ourselves up again. This is that decision that Ghanaians have to make. So when you, regardless of where you are in the world, you need to be calling up two, 300, of your family and friends and telling them if you are in Ghana, like you said, Annie, you need to find all the people who could vote for Kofi Karanting by going yeah. onto our website, kofikaranting.com, kofikaranting.com and registering with us. Make sure you start your own Facebook, you start your own WhatsApp group and support kofikaranting.com campaign. Correct. This is not about kofikaranting. This is about Ghana. This is not about kofikaranting. This is about Africa. 
if you love the place that gave birth to you, that gave you the right for you to be who you are, now is the time for you to return that, that service. And it starts by you making that call. It starts by you getting on social media and telling everybody about us and our agenda. Because if we don't, they are on standby. If we don't, they have already taken their place. You can't stop that. And they're going to take us over. It's as simple as that. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you for your great staff, all the great people in the back we couldn't see. And again, our condolences uh, to President Pierre, the people, beautiful people of Burundi, uh, for this sad, sad event. But it's a reminder that we have a responsibility to deliver to our people because you just never know when. Thank right. you. And we're looking forward to coming back and visiting with you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kofi. And um, yes, I can guarantee you that the Pan-African Daily TV is gonna put, um, keep in touch with you to see the updates and follow and from our part, we are going to mobilize and we're going to create this this opportunity and advice and gather and rally behind ghana because the success of ghana is going to determine 2020 the success of the entire continent of africa with this kind of leadership so i promise and you from our desk and from the young people yes go ahead no i was saying that and a good thank you to a uh, brother and a friend, uh, compatriot, uh, Mr. Farouk Al Wahab. Uh, Farouk has been an incredible, incredible human being and a counsel. And uh, I know Farouk introduced us to you, and we are so thankful uh, for him and his friendship. And uh, we're going to be talking to him soon, but we really wanted to publicly thank him for introducing us to you. Good. Thank you. I also appreciate it. I mean, where would we have been having this kind of a wisdom and um, this kind of leadership for now? So, yes, we are the platform that connects and, 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 and share our views and promote and brand the Africa that we want. And we're looking forward to continue following you up in these elections and to mobilize Ghanaians and Africans uh, generally. Every Ghanaian has to get a family to vote. It, it's not going to happen like that. So thank you so very much for being here and for thank coming. You in touch and we are gonna have you again anytime soon we'll thank announce you. thank you very thank much good night god bless take you take care take care bye-bye yes and uh, for you our listeners that are watching i want to thank you so much for being so patient and one very important uh, announcement we are going to shift the times we're going to shift and come back to the normal times that we were streaming because you know um, it's getting late out there and, 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 and children need to go to bed and schools uh, are going on again and and, and, and and the businesses and and the pandemic is gradually slowing down and so things are reopening and renormalizing. And so it means also we from the Pan-African Daily TV, we will be shifting our programs ahead to start early so that we can also end. But watch out for the program tomorrow and the flyer dropping in and also for the time. Time changes. We don't know whether it's going to happen tomorrow or before, but you will be communicated and updated. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Tomorrow we're going to have a member of the PLO, uh, the, the organization of the PLO Foundation, um, about this conference coming up on the 27th of June. And we're also going to be accompanied, like I told you, from a princess um, who is changing the world just through a poem. Thank you so very much and good night from our end. God bless you. We see ourselves.